Good morning again. As, as promised, we're going to have a very good partner and his workforce partners that have expanded registered apprenticeship opportunities here in uh, South Texas. I have worked, I want to say, several years with um, Dr. Doc, Dr. Margo, and it's been an absolute pre uh, pleasure. I think I said um, at the event earlier in the week that I love having a partner that answers the phone when you call or text when you call. Um, I hope he feels the same. Well, I did answer your text last night at what time? <laughs> um, to make sure that he, he has a video that he's going to show to y'all uploaded in the system. So I'm just going to tell you he's a wonderful partner, so I know he's a wonderful partner with his workforce partners. South Texas College is great to work with. Everybody that's been on the stage has been great partners in expanding, but I know that you're going to love this session. So Carlos, I'm going to turn it off over to you. Thank you, Desi. And yes, it has been a pleasure working with Desi, her team, uh, Commissioner Alvarez, all you've done as an ambassador, but as a commissioner all across the state for apprenticeship training. And it's great to have the annual apprenticeship conference here in McAllen. And we happen to be here in South Texas College, but the key to the success, and this is uh, what I will allude to, but today you will hear that the key to our success, and there have been bumps and bruises, but nevertheless, the key is employers. And that's why I specifically chose employers uh, and our employer partners um, to be here today and, and share their experiences. But before that, and I know it was kind of last minute, I do want to share a, a video that our wonderful PR team put together on our very recent graduation that we had for a construction superintendent program. Um, it was just two days ago, so it was kind of last minute, but if I could uh, play that video right now before I proceed with the panelists. Today is a momentous and very important day due to the fact that we are developing a new partnership, something never done before. With the help of Texas Workforce Commission and South Texas College partnering, we're able to provide funds that uh, allow them to go through this program, pay for all the materials, books, and so forth. Tell me how many other parts in the state of Texas and in the country are awarding this grant. Tell me, how many other programs do we have a superintendent program like this in Texas? Name them. You can't, because this is one of the few, if not the only one. I'm one of the first female to actually go through the STC program. I'm very honored and excited about that. The importance of STC offering this for a student like myself is it gives me a pathway to actually know what it entails in the construction field. And this is a very much of a career that I really respect only because you see it with another set of eyes in the sense that you actually take with you and you give back to your community. I want to congratulate each one of y'all. Um, I get choked up too. I think apprenticeship changes lives. I think that y'all will see that it changes y'all's lives as well. These are people that graduated today that have families and have jobs and they're, they're, they've been affected in a tremendously positive way by this particular uh, certification. Okay, now I'm going to switch over to a brief PowerPoint and um, don't really like PowerPoints, but nevertheless, I did want to give information because the theme of our presentation today is how and why. And I will touch on how we do the, our apprenticeship programs. They are registered apprenticeship programs, how we do it. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> excuse me, will tell you about how we do it or why. And it's very important. We do it a certain way. It may be different for everybody across the state. Uh, we're not perfect, but we have had successes. We have over 10, we can go to the next slide, 12 registered apprenticeship programs right now. And I just want to give you a brief overview of what we do, and you'll see that it is cross-industry. What we do at the college is traditionally was our industrial-related occupations, and we registered apprenticeship programs way back in the day when it was a very different registered apprenticeship process. Uh, with the Department of Labor in the early 2000s. We had industrial maintenance, plastics process technician, and, um, and machining. But today we have expanded to the ones that you see here. And on the next slide, you'll see all the ones that we have under development. 
But before I continue, I do want to say thank you to the Texas Workforce Commission because these apprenticeship Texas grants, referred to as expansion grants, allow us to not only develop, these funds allow us to hire subject matter experts, work with employers, use the DACOM process to develop curriculum based on actual job descriptions. And that takes money, it takes time, it takes effort. And these are the programs that you see right now that are under, currently under development. Veterinary technician is not something that we had, a huge demand for vet techs in the, in, the, in the region. We just didn't have anything at South Texas College, so there was a need, and actually that request came from a school district. <clears throat> Excuse me, the school district said, I want some of our juniors and seniors to learn how to be veterinary technicians. It's a process. You know, you gotta have uh, uh, certifications and so forth. But we'll prepare them to be vet tech assistants, then of course, take the appropriate veterinary technician examinations required by the state, veterinary medical association, et cetera. But that's a simple example of somebody asking for something and us taking charge and doing it. And another thing I'm gonna mention is the fact that I really have learned and uh, come to dislike meetings. Um, meetings are meetings sometimes. You meet and the word itself means meet, right? So I no longer <laughs> like having meetings. If you're gonna have something, let's call it a workshop. If you're gonna visit, I've been at the college too long to be able to be having these meetings with people where nothing gets done. And that's essentially how we do it. If you're going to meet, I'll just, just call it a workshop. At the end of when we visit with employers, with other organizations who are going to be there to help, I want to know who's going to do what, when, and how, and that's it. If I can't answer those questions, then we're not going to visit. And that's exactly how these programs have come to be. An employer tells us we want to do these programs, we take charge, we do it but there's no fluff in between, there's no meetings to have meetings or meetings to plan meetings, which I'm sure we've all been <laughs> in those before, but that uh, next slide will show you a little bit about structurally at the college, and again, I'm gonna discuss on, uh, a little bit of how we do it. This is just a, a, a snapshot of a couple of divisions of the college. I represent industrial training, uh, which is the workforce side of the college, and then you'll see an example I think we have, and by the way, we have, I know our South Texas College uh, president and administrators are here today. I know at the same time we have professional development here next door, so if anybody else that's out <laughs> here from South Texas College, you're probably in the wrong room. <laughs> you should be next door in our professional development, but if you're here anyway, I appreciate it. This gives you an idea as to us how we work. We're on the non-credit side, and again, I'm gonna get back to that word right now because I hate the word non-credit. And then you'll see on your, I guess that would be on your, uh, to your right, would be the credit side. Just an example of, uh, we have uh, Dean Saro Lozano representing programs where our apprenticeship programs line up with academic credit programs. And in that case, there's no such thing as credit and non-credit. We're a college. At, and when you get into an apprenticeship program, customized training program, it doesn't matter because the courses that we're offering are apprentices, trainees, customized trainees, most of those courses have a relevant crosswalk over to the academic side. And how do we do that? We work with our, uh, my dean counterparts, program chairs on the ac academic side, make sure that our customized training classes meet the rigor, meet the standards, and most of the times we use the same instructors. So a lot of these blending of uh, courses are essentially the same, same courses themselves, just a different platform, different format. And that's why, I, again, going back to non-credit, I don't like that term. I prefer to call it uh, credential to credit. It sounds a little bit better because non-credit tends to be kind of a misnomer, in my opinion, because the students are getting credit. They're getting apprenticeship credit. They're getting college credit. It's not academic credit. It's not the traditional uh, type of credit, but nevertheless, that is a college student on the right side. Non-credit student, they're still getting credit. So I call it credential uh, to, uh, to credit. So the next slide, please, would be an example of one of our apprenticeship programs is an IT, and this is just a snapshot of what I'm talking about when we're talking about credential to credit. An apprenticeship program in one of our IT programs will take uh, any one of our classes, and I'm not saying 100% of the classes they take with us, because remember, on the non-credit, uh, non-academic side, what we do is we customize our classes, and sometimes they don't necessarily align with an academic course, which is fine. Nevertheless, our, our deans and our program chairs have allowed the process called uh, prior learning assessments, which I know most of you are familiar with. As long as the content is there, the rigor is there, the faculty, the, the staff that, who's uh, uh, teaching the class, the student can test out of one of these courses on the academic side and get start working on an associate, associate degree. And one other thing I want to mention is our point here is to give our students options. It's not just enough for them to get a certificate from the Department of Labor, and I'm not 
by any means uh, uh, belittling that, or a certificate of completion from South Texas College Institute for Advanced Manufacturing. I want more, and they want more, and we all want them to continue to get their associates. So it's not either or. Let them get their associates. We get bachelor, we have bachelor programs also at South Texas College. We, wanna, we want them to give them the opportunity and the options to proceed and to go on and get as much education as they can. The next slide. These are just, again, you saw a quick video. We can go through these uh, rather quickly. I know you've probably tasted some of the beer from Brew Sun Brewery, and we're really proud of that. Um, these gentlemen, it was two uh, brothers who actually started that brewery, and uh, start, our program was 2,000 hours uh, on the job learning experience for them. It was over 265 hours of instruction, very, very intense instruction. They had to have, as a prerequisite, college level math and college level science just to get into the program. So rather intensive, but that's definitely a high level brewery apprenticeship program. If you haven't already had a sample, please uh, have some uh, if you're okay drinking in the morning. <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> that was the recent, um, another graduation that we had for some other, uh, for another construction superintendent program. And I'm gonna go quickly to the next slide, please. This is, um, I know it's hard to tell. At first I thought I was gonna do a breakout session, but I guess we're not having breakout sessions here. Um, this is, otherwise I would have made this probably into multiple slides, but nevertheless, this tells you exactly how we do it. Um, and it'll take you step by step. From the very beginning, if you see the top left, how we start, we essentially need to identify an employer. That's the key. If you don't have an employer partner who's gonna be there to help you uh, not only uh, develop the program or help you identify what the occupational need is, then you're already starting off on the wrong foot. Do not try to start an apprenticeship program without an employer partner who is willing, able um, uh, to be there with you at the table, sitting down and getting things done. As I mentioned before, stop having meetings, start having workshops. And that's where, what we start doing. Identify a need, and then I like through in there, identify a school district because our apprenticeship programs are both youth and adult programs, 16 years of age, as long as you're 16, whether you're a junior or senior in high school, you can get into these programs. Again, the key, is there an employer out there who's willing to hire any of these apprentices, whether it's 16 or older? Then, as you go down through the process, I mean, you'll see it's just a matter of developing the curriculum based on an actual need that employers will tell you what they need. Work with their job descriptions, work backwards, develop curriculum. Start identifying, and I know the Department of Labor has a wonderful database of registered apprenticeship programs that you can quickly search online, um, see what already exists out there. Start working with those. If you need to customize it, which we do a lot of, and then we customize it. So don't reinvent the wheel. It's already, there are programs that are already out there, hundreds, probably thousands of programs. Work with your employers, start uh, um, customizing the program, tailor it to exactly what the needs are here locally, start preparing the documentation for the Department of Labor, uh, Appendix A, uh, Appendix D, the Employer Acceptance Agreement. We've narrowed it down to probably a three-page packet by now, and, and, and you'll see through the process. We do that, submit that, wait the couple of months it takes to get through the process of uh, DOL approval, and at the same time, start keep working with the employer. Either we're using existing incumbent employees that the employer has, who they want to train and move up from, in this case, for example, construction uh, supervisor to a superintendent. We took those employees, recruited them, and put them in this program. Work with the high school, same thing. Work with the, sky, with the school districts, screen the individuals, make sure you get the candidates that have the, at least an interest in what you get into, a level of competency. Don't just get anybody and throw them into these programs because then your retention rates are gonna go down. Then what you do, get your approval, then you start registering and get your first cohort of students. I know it may seem simplistic, but if you look at it visually, it's really not that difficult if you have the right partners in place. And I'm gonna keep going back to the employer uh, component of this entire process, because that's what makes the difference. And one thing I was gonna mention is that I've been at the college quite a while, but starting back in my early days, it always seemed that the employers were looking at the college as, okay, well, you know, lowly college, we need employees, but I guess you do what you can. And we have to turn that script, and it took years to turn it around. It's like, no, I think the employers need us more than we, we need them. And it's true, but it's not a matter of who needs more whom. Uh, who needs more, who needs whom more. I think it's a matter of how we work together equally in partnership. And the panel, when I turn it up uh, over to them right now, you can go to the next slide, please. The panelists will tell you exactly um, why. Because without the employer, uh, 
employer's input, there wouldn't be an apprenticeship program. And again, remember, apprenticeship for us is just one level of educational training programs that we have. We have all kinds of customized training. But, um, and you see here, and then the next slide will give you some other, another snapshot of employers who are participating in our apprenticeship programs. If you can switch over to the next slide. Okay, the next slide, I think it should be the, um, okay. Some of these best practices, I do want to, uh, again, because we're, I'm here to tell you how, what works for us. may not work for everybody, but these are some of the best practices. Work with qualified uh, individuals, and it turns out I've dealt with a lot of employers in the past who have said, we need employees, we need workers, we need, I mean, where are they? We turn around, go back to the college, open up a class, I'll give you an example, plumbing. We open up a class in plumbing, nobody showed up. Well, I had just had a meeting with the employer, large construction company said, I need electricians, I need plumbers, we turn around and open up a class, nobody shows up. And the question is why? So looking into it, there's, a, there's, there's something missing. There was something missing there. Employer begging us for, and not only begging us, they were getting on our case really bad, and chastising us for not getting enough uh, employees out there to, uh, for them. Uh, but we opened up the classes, they don't show up. Well, the missing connection there was what they're gonna talk about today in our panel is their participation. Employers have to go sit at the same table with you and help you develop the program, period. Can't do it without that. If they're, if they're gonna be uh, asking for employees, well then ask them to help you develop those employees, um, the programs for those employees. These apprenticeship programs, I know what was mentioned before, we had apprenticeship program, we had people talking about funding for apprenticeship program. Yes, we've had expansion uh, grants, but you know what? The empl employers are putting in a lot of time and effort. Time in business, as you all know, is money, so they're putting a lot of their time into developing these programs. So that is leveraging their resources as employers, and that is a lot of time in their side. So what started changing things around from having that big gap between an employer asking us for employees, us developing programs, opening classes, and nobody shows up, the difference was having uh, people like here at the table sitting down at the table, helping us develop the curriculum, telling us exactly what they wanted, and actually helping us with the program. As a matter of fact, some of them even, even taught for us. And that's where I'm gonna go with next. So the best practice is um, that we were talking about, again, I'm gonna, always gonna go back to the employers, dedicated staff also. We have dedicated team staff. I know you mentioned navigators. You all were identified yesterday. An apprenticeship navigator, we have Kim Moore and our team. Everything he does is apprenticeship related. You have to have a good team on there. Uh, next slide, please. Our priorities, we wanna expand. We currently have an application out for a registered nurse apprenticeship program. Again, we're expanding from the traditional uh, industrial type of uh, occupations, and we wanna move more into healthcare related um, allied health programs for apprenticeship programs. Again, the need is there. We have hospitals like DHR coming to us and saying we're desperate for nurses. I know you have a nursing program at South Texas College, they tell us, but we need to expand and we need to give these, uh, these students more hands-on experiences. Again, everything comes back to apprenticeship training. Uh, challenges, we're always gonna have challenges because of the misconceptions. You've heard this yesterday. People still think of a, an apprenticeship program as very tedious a program that requires a lot of paperwork. And yes, I will say, in my, back in my older days, it was very tedious and had volumes of paperwork that we had to submit, but it's extremely different now. As long as you have, you know what you're doing, and that chart that I had that had that little snake-looking thing on there, as long as you follow those steps, and that's what we do. It's a process map, and we just press the play button from the very beginning, identifying a need, and then find an employer, a school district, and you just keep going from there. The process is, is a lot easier from what it used to be. And I give thanks to the Department of Labor and the State Apprenticeship Office also for helping us with that as well. But we have to keep expanding awareness. I know that was talked about yesterday, but that's, it is true. People still don't know, and I will say, next door we have a room full of all STC employees, but I guarantee you, a lot of our South Texas College faculty and staff still don't know what we're doing in our department with regards to apprenticeship training. And it's not their fault. I don't think it's our fault either, and I don't think it's my staff's fault. It's just something that culturally has to continue evolving and changing. And I think the state and, and uh, Department of Labor are doing an excellent job in doing that. But if we can collectively be, as uh, was mentioned earlier, ambassadors for apprenticeship training, I think we're just gonna keep on making this um, a little bit more and more known the way it should be. 
So um, with that, I think we had, well, let me go over to one more slide, please. You can't see the bottom part, but I will close my presentation with the key to success is employer partnerships. I know you probably can't see the bottom part, but it says employer partnerships. And that's where I'm going to turn it over, turn it to the panel now, because we have an excellent team of partners here who took time off their schedule to not only tell us what their needs were, but to get, help us get the program started. And again, I will contrast that with my, my uh, discussion about prior huge, these are huge um, commercial contract companies who were just telling us they needed employees, open up the class, nobody shows up. This is different now. These employers, as employers, gave us the right tools that we needed and gave us exactly what we needed to get this, make this a successful program. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna turn it over to the panelists who will uh, give them a chance to introduce themselves. But let me just say that collectively, these uh, young men and, well, young, sort of young men, <laughs> uh, and ladies were extremely, and, and, and here's the other thing, we happen to have, um, they're friends of mine, and that helped a lot. These, these men were friends of mine, and I think that's what you got to keep doing. If you don't have that personal contact and friendship with employers, it's still gonna be college uh, employer. And again, that, that barrier has to be broken down. But I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. I know we, I think the card says there's Sarah. We don't have Sarah. Sarah had to leave to, uh, she's a project manager for a construction company, had to have an out of town meeting. Again, meeting, there you go with the word meeting. But nevertheless, she had a meeting out of town, couldn't be here. But we do have Norma who has, and you saw her on our video, an excellent success story. And I think uh, Governor Abbott even mentioned, him, mentioned her in a guest column a few days ago. So wonderful story that we have here. But if you could, gentlemen, we'll start with uh, Celso. Please introduce yourselves. Give us a little bit of background about your workforce need. Um, and then I'll continue with, uh, with the moderating of some questions thereafter. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Carlos. And I say Carlos, he is a friend of mine, but he's Dr. Margo. Uh, <laughs> my name is Celso Gonzalez. I'm with Celso Gonzalez Construction, Inc. Uh, I've been in the business my entire life. Uh, I, a lot of this came up, you know, Carlos mentioned about the brewing uh, apprenticeship program. He and I were sitting down one day drinking beers, <laughs> and uh, I told him, you know, we haven't certain situation that our superintendents aren't really getting the training that they do. Uh, I've met several uh, students that actually graduated with, from the construction management program, but it was mostly geared towards residential. So in, in our business, we're more in the private, no, the public sector business. So it's quite a bit different. It's quite a bit more work. So without going into much detail, we talked about it and actually over months, and then Joey Torino here is our director for Associated General Contractors. We started meeting up with, first of all, with Carlos and then with the STC staff. And it took some time. It took at least about a year, what do you say, about a year, year and a half to get the program together. But it's, this is where we are and it's really worked out re really well. Good morning. Everybody can hear me. My name is Joey Trevino. I'm the executive director for the Associated General Contractors of Rio Grande Valley Chapter. So I started this position t uh, March 2020, right when COVID hit. So uh, if you're not familiar with uh, AGC, we're uh, uh, an organization, construction organization that uh, has member. It's membership driven uh, with general contractors, subcontractors, specialty contractor service and industry uh, services uh, throughout the, through this region, Rio Grande Valley chapter. We also have a state chapter. We have chapters in, uh, throughout the nation and the national chapter. Um, the national chapter has been around 100 years. Uh, our Rio Grande Valley chapter has been here 70 years. So we have a, a quite, a, quite a legacy here in the construction uh, industry for, for a long time. Uh, our, our primary uh, goal is to bring the, con the construction industry together. I know, and I always start our meetings out, I said we're competitors outside, uh, but when we come in, we, we represent the construction industry. So when I started, my background is in economic development. I was an EDC director for both Westlaco and Edinburgh. I had uh, many years as a business development government relations for an engineering firm, half associates 
for 14 years. So I've been involved with construction, engineering, architectural industry for, I want to say, almost 30 years. So and we're young guys, like Carlos said, uh, in this industry. But I, I like to say just this one story that really, uh, and I, I tell this story as often as I can. Uh, I was hired at the Wesco Economic Development Corporation, and one of the first priorities, the board and the public, uh, were asking me, hey, you know, we want to bring economic development to, the, to our area, so, um, but we want Whole Foods. We want a Whole Foods uh, supermarket here. Can you, can you get it for us? And I said, well, you know, I'll try. So one of the first days I started, I called Whole Foods uh, Real Estate uh, office up and I said, hey, the, introduce myself, introduce the community. I said, the Rio Grande Valley's uh, growing. We have a young population. And they said, yeah, we know, we know everything about the Rio Grande Valley. I said, well, hey, we're going to give you land and building to open up a Whole Foods. He goes, no. He said, we know everything about the valley, but your education level is not high enough for Whole Foods. So I said, oh, my God. I mean, that was like a born and raised here in the valley working for, for many years, it was just like a, a, a knife in my heart. So I made it that, that, time, uh, that goal to, all right, we need to increase the educational level here in the Valley, whatever it takes. It's, it's a training, uh, apprenticeship training, anything. Uh, and so I think this, this opportunity when I came to AGC, I saw the need and when Celso and, and Carlos approached us, because our group, you know, we were just cannibalizing, our companies were cannibalizing each other, hiring their superintendents, or, or, and, and they were just kind of moving around. So we developed this program to, to bring people up in the ranks, uh, get that cert certification, and, and grow with the companies. And then also, like Dr. Margot said, get the associate's degree, get the bachelor's degree, and get, get the graduate degree. So that's, that's where I'm coming from on this, and I, I, I hope... Uh, this program expands, and, and I guess we'll explain a little bit more of what we do next. Thank you. This is one on. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Dan Morales, and I'm a project leader for a company called Legacy Precision. In the Rio Grande Valley, we have a lot of manufacturing that supports operations across the border, and you have big manufacturers on this side. Well. Legacy Precision serves as a, what's called a tooling supplier. So if you want to have big, big manufacturers, you know, 400 employees, you need to have the four or five of us that provide the production line tooling equipment support. Basically, my job is to listen to the customer. What is it you guys need to grow? And in those conversations, you'll hear, we need, you know, these kinds of folks that have this kind of training that can help bring this kind of work into the area. Uh, Carlos and his team had approached me what are the needs? Can we grow CNC in the area? Can we keep growing manufacturing? And it was like, well, you know, you got a budget? You know, that, that, <laughs> that was one of the, the first questions that came up. And, you know, I, TWC was really, really great in, in providing the funding to get this, this going. Uh, before being with Legacy Precision, I actually was an instructor with South Texas College for 10 years. So I have unique insight on how the college operates and then now on, on the private side, you know, what industry actually needs. So it is a a unique kind of space to occupy and seeing you know what the employees need meeting with them seeing firsthand you know being there seeing what the deficits are and then uh, understanding how you navigate also the college and, and how it works on on Carlos side they've been incredibly flexible and I say hey you know if you want to do this apprenticeship we need to do it this kind of way this is what companies are needing and when I started as an apprentice oof, you know 20 something years ago that was where you started in in the group that I had uh, I actually taught it this past year I had uh, four engineers out of 11 they were actual graduates from our, our university here so you know the the idea that th this is where you're gonna start no I mean these were these these were people with associates degrees some of them the the minimum they had were certificate degrees from from the academic side so they were looking to, to bring up that next level of skill set and it just it this sort of uh, apprenticeship program is really what was able to drive the curriculum. Okay, what, what do we need in the classroom? Um, with the budget that we also had, we were able to get some tooling. Those little tiny things is really what uh, 
uh, help with, um, sorry, uh, it, it really helped get the, uh, the employees to that next skill set. And, uh, you know, giving them just even the tooling uh, at the end of the program helped. Uh, it, it, it shows the, the employers that we are committed, that these employees are committed to staying in the field, you know, when you do provide them with the tooling that, that they need to, to continue with it. Okay, um, before Norma introduces herself, let me just say that she has the dual benefit of being not only an employer or part of an employer that uh, is participating, but also an apprentice. So, Norma. Good morning. My name is Norma Catalina Olivares. I actually call myself, when I introduce myself to uh, work, uh, people that I work with or people that I actually service, I go by Norma Catalina. It's a business trade name for me only because my background is not construction. My background, and I have a master's degree in education, but I was a school administrator. I resigned in 2019. My parents got very sick, so you know, you have to make a difficult decision and step back and help them out. But my husband has always been in construction, and in, he's a uh, professional engineer, uh, born and raised here in the Valley. So we have three businesses. When I jumped ship with him in 2019 to actually continue working and make ends meet for our family, I had no idea what he did on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, little to say, uh, we joined the AGC. Uh, Perry Vaughn was actually retiring at that time, but then um, he um, let us join the AGC Rio Grande chapter, and I met Joey uh, thereafter. When STC and the AGC uh, kind of paired together to actually um, join forces and offer an apprenticeship uh, uh, opportunity for me and others, I did not hesitate to jump at it. At my age, you know, I'm not uh, I, uh, um, in my early 20s anymore, but I felt like I still had that learning capability. And so on-the-job training is what I needed. And so I told Renee, uh, I'm gonna do it, and I just want your support. And it's free, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> this grant actually uh, gave me the tools to actually learn, and I went to night school. It was an online class. It was actually during COVID time also. That was very difficult because, you know, you have to be very careful. So uh, night school, and then I had a um, hands-on job site visits. There was construction management, blueprint readings. There's a lot of things that entailed if I could just tell you all the mistakes I've made, sending wrong things to architects and engineers, um, I learned. I learned the need and I respect the industry. You see, one of the things as a business owner as well is time. Time management is very important. Quality, giving quality service to um, your customer is at utmost importance. Rene is about that. He's always done that all his life, but here I am um, helping him in the business, and I needed to actually understand a lot of things as well. So the, the tools that I had and that I learned is just a snippet of probably a lot more that I need to continue learning. This is an industry that I respect, and yes, it took a lot of perseverance from my part, but also dedication because um, I rubbed elbows with other people other individuals that were already on the job training, and here I am wanting to pick their brains and find out what is it the need that you hear, and I see this too, and here you are safety, and providing, and time, and working with your subs, and sending uh, field reports, you know, uh, technical writing, putting it together to make it sound what you need and not wasting anybody's time. So STC gave me that opportunity I took it to heart. I'm very um, fortunate because I do have um, employees that I, we work with and customers and uh, other many people that I actually am involved with. Also, we started the Women in Construction because of this, because I'm an advocate for females in the sense that, you know, we are the other set of eyes that we can help in this industry. By no means, it is not something a woman would ever do on their own. Uh, men and women join forces to actually do things and add better quality to serve our customers. But for me, taking the time as an employer to support this apprenticeship is vital because it doesn't just stop there. I didn't just graduate 
and it stops there. I'm on the job learning. One of the true stories is, you know, working in the, with the schools for 24 years, I was climbing a ladder on a roof taking pictures because we were going to put a bid out. And here I am putting a report together, trying to get estimates and everything. Then they said, Norma, is that Olive Adams up there? They saw me through the cameras. <laughs> you know, um, I'm doing something different. I'm actually measuring, I'm actually understanding what, um, what architects and engineers on a day-to-day, -day, their professional level of expertise is I'm learning. So I run the office um, here. Uh, that's what I do with my husband. And um, I support this. I've already sent another employee out here to SCC on the second cohort. I was one of the f one of four females that joined the first cohort. And I'm very fortunate enough, and thank you so much to SCC. And I, um, because um, this learning that I take to heart, um, I take and I continue advocating because this apprenticeship gave me a, a big opportunity for me to continue working with other people, understanding, but also to give back to my community. Like, I love the Valley. I think there's a lot of things I can actually give only because I can understand. And one of the things that I can tell you about the Valley, we have a lot of got, uh, good, hardworking folk. We have a lot of good, hardworking people that really, really want to learn they just need an opportunity like I did. And so I just thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and I know we mentioned uh, AGC, that's the Associated General Contractors of uh, the, the Rio Grande Valley. That was huge. That's Joey, Mr. Joey Trevino represents as executive director an organization made up of a lot of general contractors here in the region. And that's what helped us really put this program together. So again, another lesson learned, work with industry organizations as much as you can, because collectively they will help you get the volume and uh, they represent the needs of all their memberships. It's huge, just like our South Texas Manufacturers Association. Work with, um, of course, like with Daniel, because he represents manufacturing. The others on the panel represent uh, construction. I know we have a lot of other programs, but let me go back to a, a quick question. Of all the programs that we have, not just apprenticeship, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here at South Texas College, we have hundreds of non-credit programs. We have our credit programs, et cetera. The simple question is, why apprenticeship? Mr. Gonzalez. Why the apprenticeship? Uh, superintendents, in apprenticeship, our apprenticeship was a construction superintendent, not project managers, not the labor. Uh, not the estimators, the superintendents. Superintendents are a, a rare beast of employees. They, they come from all traits of life. I mean, whether, they may not have a high school degree. They may not, you know, they may be, it can be hard to say, they may be ex-cons. We hire everybody, but it's people with common sense. But the apprenticeship program, what it does, it's teaching the core values of each discipline involved. I mean, there's, normally I'll tell you, there's blueprint reading, there's uh, uh, project leaders, leadership on there. So, so there's, this program is gonna take everybody. I, I did, I did a, a survey when they, the first class started, and I asked the students in that class, it was about 30 students, one simple question. How many students in this class have a degree beyond high school? or any education beyond high school, there was two. I think you were gonna ask that question, there was only two out of the 30. But these are uh, employees who are basically building this building. They're communicating through, with subcontractors, they're communicating with architects and engineers. They are the eyes and ears. I'm the president of our company, I'm also a project manager, but they are my eyes and ears out there. They make a mistake, I hate to say it, I lose a lot of money. So teaching these guys to read the plans, teaching these guys how to communicate uh, is very important. So the apprenticeship program basically come in here and starts teaching these employees just the basics of what we need. And from there, this industry, you're not gonna learn, and Norma, you know this, you're not gonna learn this industry in two weeks two months, two years, it's gonna take you 10 years to learn a little bit of everything. But at least you get the seed planted and you go from there. 
I believe the apprenticeship is important uh, because it's on the job training, of course, uh, of everything. But years ago, you know, we were pushing college education, and you get out of high school, college, 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 and you're you're getting loans and paying these loans, and all of a sudden you owe more than you're going to make <laughs> in the <laughs> next uh, 10 years. Apprenticeship makes a lot of sense because you're you're working, you're on the job, you're learning, and uh, it, it, it's just you come out ahead. You come out ahead once, and and you're you you got a great career. And again, I, if I look back at everything, I wouldn't in my life. You know, that I would probably go the apprenticeship route uh, and and work my way up. And it's hard to struggle. Uh, you know, we, I had two two daughters who graduated the university, and they, they struggled a little bit. They had some. Uh, they still have those bills and, and those loans, but uh, you know. And now I'm encouraging them to go back and do apprenticeship programs. But uh, I think that's what's important. Well, the apprenticeship group that I had was 11 from all kinds of different manufacturers. Some manufacturers would make plastic bags. Some manufactured plastic goods. Some did metal stamping. Just the kind of manufacturing is just, it, it's very, very diverse in our area. Some are, you know, aviation. And the apprenticeship program for me was, I get to have this group of 11. And again, some of them had associates, some had bachelor's degrees, but they all, again, ultimately they, they needed, they, they'd been in the field about five years already, and then they wanted to, they, they, they're committed to the field, but they just need that next set of skills. So we would meet from about 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. And just twice a week for six weeks, we'd focus on just one class. And one plant manager, when the program ended back in May, you know, he tells me, he's like, hey, you know, with uh, this one student I had, his name was Frank. And, he, you know, he says, I've, I've noticed such a difference in, in Frank after, you know, participating with that program. And, I mean, th those, those are powerful moments for me. You, you, you take that on and you get to be part of that, you know, in, in each individual journey. Uh, but also it means that I have to rise that, to that occasion as, as the instructor of that group because, again, all the manufacturers are asking for something completely different. And maybe it, it's that way with the construction, building bridges is different than, a, a, you know, apartments. But what, what the demands are, okay, we, we have to listen to that. You know, what, what is it each individual employer needs and, you know, how can we bring that together? And, you know, again, this was not a group that had just started or just graduated high school that wanted to just get started. No, no, these are, these are folks that have already been in the field for a long, long time. And the apprenticeship program, what I can tell you is as an employer <clears throat> and also as a student, you are actually investing time in your company, in businesses, using the apprenticeship program because you are actually sending out some employees who you want to actually take care of. You want them to get good information, valuable, critical information, just like I did. Um, you're developing other people to actually be another set of eyes and ears for you and actually do a good job. That's what we are about. I mean, again, I, I can't stress enough that time management and quality of service is probably those two things that are key to this construction industry. So I support the apprenticeship program because you are, as you screen as an employer, you screen people that you're going to hire. You're not just going to hire anybody. So when you have opportunities, opportunities like these, like I did, you want to send them. You want to invest some time and have them learn, and at the same time, they have to work. I have to work. It's not something that I don't think, if they see an employer actually be gung-ho about this program and support it, they'll be the same too. I know I am very much of an advocate, so that's why I did that. I continue sending other individuals. I've had interns from the university. I've had um, people come and go in our business, but the thing about it is that they will only continue if you actually will support something as this program, because it does, I went through blueprint reading, I went through construction management, uh, two and three, and then leadership. It actually gives you a, um, a uh, 
opportunity to see it differently. And then it only, it doesn't stop there, but the apprenticeship program is about exactly what the employer should do. Take someone underneath their wing and continue developing them. If we don't invest the time to do that for our employees, it's, they're gonna go somewhere else and go get it. We wanna make sure we invest for our businesses here in the Valley, because it is a competitive, but it's also a growing industry that I really admire and support. Sometimes I regret not doing it earlier. <laughs> but that's why I, I will support the apprenticeship program here. Just to give you an idea of how the, the construction superintendent program was, it was a year-long program, by the way, 2,000 hours of on-the-job training. But when we started it, it's one day on Tuesdays they would meet physically in our campus, do our, of course, the related instruction part, meeting two days, two days a week. But on the second day of the week, they wanted to do site visits. They advised, we wanted the apprentices to go out and do it on a rotational basis, go out to all these different construction, actual construction sites, projects that are going on. And, and, uh, and I told uh, Celso, I said, but there's already an OJT component. He said, no, but still, I want them to get that hands-on experience as part of the related instruction at different sites. And the unique thing about the, uh, the general contractors is they're all bidding for projects against each other. There's still yet an association, really strong association, but they're bidding for projects. I think one of you all probably built this building, right? <laughs> you wish. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but... <laughs> Kidding. But uh, anyway, they, they are projects like this, and they're bidding for the same projects. Yet at the end, they are friends. They are working together for the betterment of the community. And that's what I want to say. You know, congratulations to you all as an organization. Um, Daniel representing manufacturing, the same thing. South Texas Manufacturing Association, the same thing. They're out there working, but it's a little bit more diverse in manufacturing over here. Um, but still, y'all have done an excellent job, a great job helping the college, and I cannot s stress enough. The key takeaway here is go have beer with your employers. It's important. And I know it was kind of tongue-in-cheek when Celso was mentioning that, but it was true. We were actually talking about that because we have our daughters played soccer together, and we just never made that connection about training until he brought it up. But if you're not having that beer with your employer, you're never going to connect. And that doesn't have to be alcohol. It could be a Diet Coke. But still make that connection, that personal contact connection with employers, otherwise this will never happen the way you want it to happen. I think we're gonna, we have about a half an hour left. Let me have one more round of questions uh, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. But for now, as a panel, um, it doesn't have to be all of you, but some of you or all of you, whatever, uh, what can you tell the rest of the state or what can you, the question was, what can the rest of the state learn from your experiences with the apprenticeship program or just your experience as an employer in this region? What can the rest of the state learn? From my perspective, the state, I think, could learn. You are never too old to start. Um, you know, I had a career of 24 years of service with uh, being uh, in education, but I started at 45, this new career. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So. It's, you're never too old to start. And if you do start, you're gonna like it and stick with it because it offers a great wealth of opportunity for you to grow in different areas. I might not know how to do masonry or even do carpentry, but I do understand and I can actually go ask and probably uh, understand that type of communication now completely. So that's one thing I would take. I'll say one benefit would be uh, the way it's structured, the classes that we offered in the apprenticeship program from this past year, it might not be the same next year. There has to be that component of flexibility depending on what, in my case, what employers, uh, what companies are involved. You know, we might offer fundamentals of CNC, we might offer an advanced programming class, and it, it does offer that flexibility that, you know, maybe more traditional academic routes, you have to go through several layers of approval, and here it's like, you know, what do the employers need? This is, this is a class that we can plug in, and it, it has to be flexible. And there does have to be a lot of communication, uh, you know, with, with the departments that are, you know, with Carlos, uh, you know, we, we do talk a lot, or I keep in touch a lot with, uh, with his department on, you know, just whatever they might need. Uh, you know, simple thing that we did was we just, we made a flyer, and we just put the schedule and just emailed it out, and we did give it to uh, the South Texas Manufacturers Association, and it was a flyer of a student 
and a picture of the lab and just, you know, this, these are the dates of when the class is going to be. And, you know, they help distribute it and, and, and you know, work together with them. Uh, I know in, in, in my industry, there has been a bigger need to bring more work back from overseas. Uh, you know, they call it quote unquote nearshoring. And it has, I'm not going to say led to a boom, but manufacturers have been really, re really rethinking this global supply chain and they have been trying to bring more work back to the US. Or you know even just to uh, you know North America to Mexico as well. So the industry has to change, and, and the kind of work that is coming in that might have been done overseas is being done here. So again, we have to be able to adapt. The technology is changing, the computing is changing, the software is changing, and there's just there's constant updates. And you know I will say that on my end in in, in working with STC or with South Texas College, uh, you know they they really did give us what was needed and you know again with TWC giving us the budget that we really needed to get this kind of thing off the ground and it did take probably a year from when we had first started to get this going and then you know I, I can confidently say yeah we're going to continue it this year as well. Um, about a year ago uh, we had a AGC national sent me an email uh, to, to invite us to the national apprenticeship uh, program in uh, St. Louis and uh, First thing that came to my head was the, uh, Commissioner Alvarez and the uh, Texas Workforce, and we had already got the, the classes going. Uh, they invited him as uh, one of the speakers, and he, he promoted this program nationally to, to, through AGC and, and, uh, and gave accolades to STC and, and our AGC local chapter. People were actually talking about that for quite a while. I was getting a lot of emails and a lot of compliments, and, and, and I'd like to thank the Texas Workforce for helping us on that, and especially Commissioner Alvarez. Uh, but I think that promoting this across the state, across the nation, it, it, it's, it's, in, it's important, and I think that's going to help. Uh, uh, maybe offering more uh, opportunities, satellite, because like here with SDC, we have it's the Rio Grande Valley's a big region now, so uh, we need to kind of spread it out. Traffic is terrible, as you all know, if you all drove in here. Uh, maybe uh, developing different satellite opportunities and, and uh, to make it easier for our apprentices to go to the classes and, and, and get, the, get that accreditation. You know what, one thing I'll throw in real <laughs> fast is, yeah, get, getting the apprenticeship program started, I'm gonna say it's, it's not going to be, it's not the easiest process to get going. But now that it is going, I know that when we go to do round two of this or continue it, I, I don't really see there being as difficult of a recruitment process because now you have, uh, you know, one or two people at a company that they have risen to that next level after, you know, training for a year. And their coworkers now are, are saying, you know, how do I take that class or how do I get involved with it? So, you know, it once, you know, getting it started is difficult, but once it's going, it's also nurturing it and, and continuing it. You know, and Daniel, you're correct. I was gonna say is the main thing that, that state can learn about this is, is getting it started. Follow up, uh, Carlos, uh, Dr. Margo saw, I mean, he's done several programs but it's having the employers out there who are willing to put the time and, and then the follow-up. You know, it did take a lot of meetings. It took a lot for us to put this together. Once STC understood what we wanted, they took the bull by the horns and they took it over. I think we're in what, our third or fourth COVID class? On fourth. On fourth already? Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's going pretty well. There's people still calling. They want to keep on taking it. There's more things that we want to explore. I mean, because the construction industry, people look at it as, wow, build a house, build a building. Guys are doing it. They're making money. But there's a lot that goes into building a building. Uh, this one, as I mentioned earlier, is more public sector, which is work for the schools, the cities, the state which means you're dealing with the architects and the engineers, and that's not an easy task. But putting it together, following up is cool. You mentioned something earlier about technology is always changing. I'm sure, I'm sure yours is the, changing. The biggest, the biggest uh, thing that has helped the construction industry is this right here, the cell phone. You know, you get people asking, uh, what's going on over there? Well, send me a picture. 
It wasn't there. Okay, I got in. How do I invoice you? Just take a picture of the invoice. Boom, you get paid. Mm -hmm. You know, every, it's, there's a lot less paperwork now. You know, uh, emails. Do we all have time to read all the emails? We do. I mean, my, my day is I'm in the mornings out in the fields, and the afternoons I go and look at my emails. Uh, they're important, but if you really want it to, you know, I go by my emails first, text messages when it's something that needs it right away. So uh, to learn is really you got to follow up and you listen to somebody in that industry and they will basically tell you that they're suffering for lack of people working, the lack of knowledge. It's just spending the time putting the program together. And in, in talking about the phone, um, it, it's communication, yes. right? It, mm -hmm. It's learning that ability. And, and I will tell you in, in the, the group that I worked with, you, you can... We could show them how to do all these perfect machining operations, but I'm not going to lie, probably the first hour, hour and a half of each night that we would meet, it was just teaching them how to be better professionals. I mean, that, that was the one thing that some of them wanted to climb up into supervisory roles or some of them were young and, and you know, they're in that awkward phase of, you know, wanting to go from the shop to, you know, climb to be that <laughs> next level programmer. And part of it was just teaching them how to kind of grow out of that awkwardness and, and be a professional. And I think that was one of the things that, you know, in the group that I, I worked with, they, they did, you know, they did start to grow out of that show. It's so funny, because I, I just one quick one, I, I tell my employees, send me a picture of what's going on. There's a budget line or something, they take a picture real close. And I said, no, I want you to take a picture 20 feet away, I can, so I can see what's going on around. So they send me the picture, I said, okay, good, you can fix that. Well, why didn't you move that pile of dirt over there that was supposed to get moved three weeks ago? You know, it's like. <laughs> well, in, in my case, they would ask me, hey, uh, you know, this happened in the shop or, you know, this little, you know, issue happened. How do I deal with it? And I was like, well, you know, like, I got to dig into, you know, the pocket of being dad or big brother yes, and, you know, yes. give them the advice on, well, you know, you, you can't say it that way, but, you know, there is this other way you can say it. So teach them how to be better professionals. Yeah, and I can also add scheduling. Um, it, you all know this. Scheduling is a very big deal in this construction field because um, it, it, you rely on A, B, and C, how to get and finish a point. And then that's a critical path for something else that's going to have to happen. So this opportunity was very good because you worked during the day. And then at night school on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, we went to school. And, you know, so it doesn't stop. So, of course, like Daniel was saying, technology is always changing. But there's no excuses. There will always be an excuse for something, but there's no excuses in this construction industry because there, you can't. There's no room for mistakes, but there are things that we have to do and teach them. So this is an opportunity. I mean, um, it's there. It's at night. It is a, a sacrifice, but it's a good one. So I support it completely. One, one thing that uh, it was getting the employers to make sure they were committed, you know, let, where, uh, you know, it's manufacturing, and, and I'm sure in construction, it's maybe the same where there's a lot of overtime. And, you know, we had to make sure and make sure Monday, Wednesday night was kind of sacred and, you know, they wouldn't schedule them for overtime. So it's really about communicating to the employers that, you know, are, are you guys going to be serious about letting your, you know, your employees participate in this and, and making it clear that, you know, it's not going to be acceptable for them to miss, you know, this part of the lecture because one thing leads into the next. So, it, you know, making sure that the employers themselves are actually committed to it is, is one thing that, they, they, they got to believe in it. They got to be part of it. And they've got to allow the employees to, you know, spend the time in it. Yeah. Well, on the delivery, I know I mentioned at the beginning uh, some of the strengths. What really helped this pro both of these programs is the fact that we have a strong distance education uh, department. A lot of our courses were placed on an online format, and that helped a lot. I mean, obviously, these individuals are working full time. Distance education really helped a lot. A lot of it obviously has to be done. Uh, in person, but the distance ed part of it, I don't know if our staff is still here from, but thank you for, for doing a lot of these courses. We upload them into our, our Blackboard uh, format. Um, so um, yeah, what I want to do, I know we have about 15 minutes here uh, for questions. I think would that be okay to open it up for questions? I think we have a couple of microphones um, scattered throughout. So you can borrow mine. I'm sorry? You can borrow. Oh, you can borrow his, yes, correct. So at this point, do we have any questions from, um, from the audience? I, 
Hi there. I'm Karen Stubblefield. I uh, work for the Workforce Board in Deep East Texas. And we hear um, from our colleges and training providers the challenges of finding um, qualified instructors. So I wonder if you could address where you are with that and what, um, how you've overcome that. Yes, we have to bribe them with steak dinners, but they, <laughs> the <laughs> employers themselves provide a lot of the subject matter experts. They are the best <clears throat> instructors we can have. Retirees are the best instructors. You just got to look for them. People who are in the industry, who have moved on, we try to snag them. We, especially, we give them the, the training for the, the, the pedagogy part. We teach them how to do the, the actual instruction. But they bring the subject, ma the subject matter, and they're the best ones. And Celso told me from the very beginning, these classes better not be Mickey Mouse <laughs> courses. They better be rigorous because we're gonna have construction folks in the class asking tough questions. And you better not have somebody in there who has no idea how to read a blueprint because they're gonna tear them up. And that's true. If you've got instructors, and, and that goes right back to your question, it's very difficult to find that right person to teach a class. Daniel Morales here happens to have the benefit of both. He's, he was a faculty for South Texas College in our machining program, manufacturing program rather for years, then started up his own business, continued working for us, and that's the ideal candidate. Somebody who has the industry experience, who can teach, will take care of the teaching training part, uh, classroom, but they bring in the, the expertise. So we work with industry a lot. Celso Gonzalez actually offered to teach himself. So um, he wouldn't do it for free, but nevertheless, he's still gonna teach I, for us. I'm, I'm glad that you had enough staff to do it. So, <laughs> so but but case in point, he volunteered, and well, not actually volunteered, but he volunteered his services to teach, and that's how we find it in industry. We, we, it's hard, yes, but we really uh, focus on industry representation to help us with faculty. I think one, one opportunity was that uh, we had site visits uh, on job, uh, different jobs throughout the area. And I remember it was Celso's project in Westlaco, and Norma was there with her hard hat and boots and her vest, and she was asking all the questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I think the on on the on site visits with the superintendent, with the owner, was very important uh, to get uh, get that knowledge. One one thing I'll throw in on that on finding the instructors was, uh, you know, years ago one time, there's one manufacturer and they do carbide metal stamping. Uh, they, they use carbide dyes for, in their metal stamping and that's an incredibly, incredibly specific kind of dye and they wanted uh, the college to put a class together for their tool makers and it's like, how in the heck is someone from the college gonna teach on carbide metal stamping dyes? So, you know, at that point in time, it was a matter of, okay, you know what? Maybe the guys in the shop aren't the best at talking or communicating, working with an instructor and putting curriculum together with the company. That was, that was one approach that we had done at that point in time was, you know, taking someone from industry, taking from someone from the school that, you know, and put those things together and, and a curriculum was made to help them. So, you know, that, that was one approach. Thank you. And you remember my slide where I showed the, uh, the academic and uh, the non-academic side of the college. We use our internal faculty at South Texas College a lot as well. <laughs> Um, another question over here? Yes. Good morning. My name is Patricia Beard, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of COSTEP in the Rio South Texas Education and Community Development Foundation. I know that's kind of lengthy, but um, our mission is to connect the education sector to the business sector. Um, and the reason why we have two organizations is one is focused on higher education and workforce development, and the other is focused on economic development and bringing in quality businesses into the region. So um, our data shows that our number one, if you want to call it commodity, that we ship out of our region is our people. And so my question this morning is related to placement. You know, what is the placement rate of um, the individuals that graduate from the apprenticeship program? That's question number one. The placement rate for our apprentices? Yes, sir. Okay, in this particular case, we had 100% placement because it kind of was the reverse. We had employers, incumbent workers who were working at uh, probably frontline supervisors who wanted to get that next level of, uh, of supervision or management rather, superintendent. So that was already right there. That was kind of a gift to us. They were already placed. We just uh, registered them as apprentices, but then we started with the OJT for the construction superintendent in that case. 
Other cases, it's very difficult. When we get into the healthcare areas, uh, working with high school students, the placement rate can be challenging, I will say that. Trying to get individuals into our auto automotive apprenticeship program sometimes can be difficult too. Uh, talking about hazardous uh, uh, tasks can be an issue to get around, but I don't have an exact placement rate to share with you, but most of our programs are kind of like this, that we're working with incumbent workers that are already working and we're pushing them up to that next level of technician, et cetera. Yeah, and like I said, the reason why I asked that is because our foundation, the educational side, has invested millions of dollars in education, you know, in the Rio Grande Valley. And like I said, we see those dollars leaving instead of staying here in the valley. And part of that has to do, the jobs aren't available. So um, the other question I have is related to um, more of maybe an ask uh, from TWC or someone to help us when we go out and speak about apprenticeship programs, really helping the businesses understand what their investment is, understand time is investment. What I'm hearing is that the participants in the program get to um, take advantage of a free program, but somebody's paying for it. So um, if we could have, you know, something where we go out and advocate for apprenticeship programs, it would be really very beneficial because we see that as a real hurdle when we're speaking to businesses, oh, we don't have the time or, you know, I don't have, you know, monies to invest in this. And we go back and say, you know, if you're not doing this, you're going to be behind the eight ball. You are not going to have folks that you're going to be able to hire. So um, anyway, that would be really beneficial. Last, uh, program expansion, at least one of the panelists spoke to that. My understanding is that there are educational shared agreements between institutions across uh, the region where you could, where you share your particular programs with each other. Is that still the case or not? We, yes, historically here at South Texas College, we had partnership agreements with uh, TSTC and Harlingen with UT, at the time UTB, TSC, but of course now TSC. That was under the, uh, something called NAMRI. We actually shared, and at the time there were apprenticeship programs and in injection molding, and we each had our expertise, our level of air, uh, machining. I think we focused on the camp, but yes, we had inter, inter uh, agency agreements at the time. We don't have it anymore, but it was a really good concept. It lasted about 10 years, but uh, the acronym was uh, NAMRI. It was a great regional alliance. Hopefully one day we can do that again. At this point, we don't have that anymore, but it worked great back then. Okay, and just, I guess, going back to the gentleman's point about, you know, they need programs expanded across the region, that would certainly be beneficial. So, thank you. Thank you. No problem, thank you. Good questions, great comments. Uh, do we have another? Um, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, over here. <clears throat> yes, good morning. Usually when I come up to a mic, I, I'm about to sing karaoke, but not today. <laughs> My name is Gerardo Garza. I am with the Texas Veterans Commission. Uh, I go by Jerry. I'm embedded in a workforce solutions in the best workforce board, which is Lower Rio, right, Shelly? Um, I am a rural veterans career advisor. I have a couple of my coworkers here. They're local veterans employment representatives. However, I am an RVCA. I do what they do, but I do it better. <laughs> my question, I have two questions, um, and it's because I heard this from the other presenters yesterday. So my questions are, how many veterans have you had participate in your program here at South Texas, um, your apprenticeship program? And number two, what are the efforts being made to outreach veterans? And then my last comment would be, I would like to attend some of your association meetings to maybe talk to your association about hiring veterans. So just those two questions. How many veterans, the second question was, I'm sorry? How many veterans have you had um, participate in your program, and what efforts are being made to outreach veterans to participate in your program? Okay, um, we have, I guess we've enrolled over 200 apprentices overall. Unfortunately, I, have, I don't have that number. We have staff over here, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Maybe about 15 is what you're saying? 15%. 15%, okay. So he's saying about 15% of that. Um, and 
Fortunately, at the college, we do have a, a department focusing on, on, uh, on reaching out to, to various populations, including veterans. I'm not sure exactly who the staff is, but we do have a dedicated team at SDC that does nothing but focus on recruitment and uh, outreach to veterans, our veteran population. Okay. I also participate in the Rio Grande Valley uh, Coalitions meetings. Mm -hmm. I'm on two boards at the Dow County Community Service Agency, but the main one that I'm proud of is the veteran ones, so because that's what I do. So if any of y'all need any information, I'll be... We know there. where to find you. Yes. Look up look up the South Texas Manufacturers Association. Maybe you should try to connect with I'll them. get with Joshua Vasquez with uh, Shelly's team. I just wanted to tell you, in the first cohort, we were 30 that we started, and when we introduced ourselves, there was two that actually served for our country. So, um, and they were working with other uh, construction companies taking the course with me. So just wanted to tell you that they were there. And we appreciate that as well. Um, we have, are we switching back? We have another question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, this is Jason uh, from the Texas Deaf Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. Um, I am speaking not just for NG, but from my personal observation of the solar PV industry, which I have been in for the past 12 years now. Um, I do see two challenges. Um, the first one is, uh, at the moment, there is no actual registered apprenticeship programs for the solar PV industry in Texas. Uh, many of the solar contractors are interested and the IREC, the Interested Renewable Energy Council, attempted to establish a national model uh, for registered apprenticeship, but the, it wasn't approved by the USDOL. I personally believe it is because there's no local or regional groups that, uh, that should got gotten established. It is my understanding that the right path for a successful establishment of a registered apprenticeship. Is that correct? Solar was a question, right? You're talking about solar? Solar, industry. solar, industry. solar, solar PV. Okay. We looked at that, and that we, I, we, and whenever I were looking at a program, I always look at the occupation, I look at the jobs uh, when it comes to solar. Um, and we did look at as, as one of our service uh, counties, is Stark County, uh, to our west and including wind energy, wind energy, and, and we get the requests. But as I mentioned before, you know, let's not have meetings, let's have workshops. And I wanna know who, what, and when are we gonna do something? And unfortunately, I could answer those questions. There was not enough demand for a renewable energy apprenticeship program because that was too broad and too vague. Who were we gonna train? What were the jobs? Um, and where were they gonna get placed? And, if you don't meet that criteria, we can't start an apprenticeship program until we have the volume of trainees. There was, and, and I'll tell you exactly why, because the way they maintain those wind, wind, uh, windmills in, um, in Star County, they sub it out, they contract that out. So you don't have 15, 20 technicians kind of there all the time that we could train. They have issues, they have problems, preventative maintenance, repairs, et cetera. They get a team out from outside come. That's the reason why we haven't done one here locally. Now, nationally, our, uh, you know, Lee Dudley could probably talk more about what exists elsewhere, but I will say that we'll probably get there eventually, but unfortunately, they just, that occupation just does not meet our criteria yet. Does that satisfy the? Thank you. So, Carlos, if you don't. <clears throat> um, I do have another question, uh, if that's fine with you guys. Um, the other challenge is that not enough training opportunities are available. There are trainings, but not on the level of the apprenticeship level. And I am seeing issues with having solar PV installers, even more for technicians, uh, to have the right training and skill set, which has been a hit and miss for the company where we use mostly third party solar contractors. Uh, the question is, how do we approach this issue as many solar contractors, including NG, work all over the place? A few contractors do focus on one geographic, but it is not as profitable. Uh, with employees not being able to stay local to attend classes. Okay, that was a little fast. <laughs> and I'm a little slow, so I... I the, the question is, how do we approach this issue as many solar contractors, including NG, work all over the place uh, with a few contractors to focus on one geographic area, but it's not as profitable uh, with employees not being able to stay local, locally to attend um, those classes? I, um, again, it just depends on volume. And, we, and, and I do have to give credit to our workforce board, Shelly and your team, Frank. We work with them a lot for the data, and we ha especially when we're grants, a lot of these grants came through the workforce uh, solutions office. 
And if we don't meet certain standards also by way of um, uh, employment and opportunities, we just can't do it. But I will say this, if there's a program that we need to start uh, sometimes with one or two, remember our, our brewery apprenticeship programs? We had two individuals. We'll do it. I mean, and I don't care. We get the funding and Workforce Solutions helped us with the funding. I'd like to start no matter what, even if it's with one individual. If we can get one individual in that industry to get trained, I'll start the program. As long as we have funding and we can do it, I'll do it. I always like to start small versus starting big and starting with low quality, but I'll start with one or two as long as we have the, the infrastructure. Maybe, Thank you, that was very helpful. Thank you. Maybe they could start a, a, an association, their own chapter, you know, of, of all the different solar installers and at least you know, Great. Start, start there. Great idea. Question over here. Actually, uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to get up. Uh, Mr. Moore invited me over. <clears throat> I'm a student, recently just got out, and I believe, Norma, I helped you guys with your job site visit. Hello. Yes, you, d you sure did. Um, I just wanted to say there's, there's multiple things that can come out of the program, but for me personally, it was being able to sit down and collaborate. Collaborate with people that are just in the industry, have been in the industry, or like me, have been in it for 25 years. So the, the program itself opened up my eyes on some things because I'm a firm believer you learn every day. Yeah. You got to be a sponge. You got to so soak stuff up. And there's different things that we have blinders on and we don't see the, the other side of the coin. So sitting in these classes, talking with the teachers, trying to help teach some of the classes, but also just listening to the people that work for me, because we had five of our own individuals from my company in there, um, but also hearing the different uh, industries' needs and, and what they're at. And the amazing thing is it's all about the same. Everybody wants to learn, everybody wants and needs that knowledge so they can go back to their employers. And I work for Central Air and Heating Service. I'm a senior PM there and uh, we're massive now. We have so much work and we just need those people that have the right attitude. We can teach them, we just need the attitude. And with your guys' program, it helps jumpstart that, uh, that goal for them. So thank you. Chad, right? Yes. yes. Thank you, Chad, you did great in the program. I appreciate the feedback. Great, thanks. Um, yes. We have one more? Do we have time for one more? Okay. <laughs> We're not going to cut the audience off, so proceed. I'm sorry. My name is Charlene Moriarty. I'm with Wyndham School District, and one of the, my title is Workforce Administrator. And uh, we are over the apprenticeship program in, inside the carcer, in, incarcerated individuals within TDCJ. Uh, one of the things that I do have is we will start an individual uh, in the apprenticeship program, but once uh, parole decides to release them, they may not be able to complete their apprenticeship program. Would y'all be help, willing to uh, take those students that released and complete them in those areas? Because you do a lot of the same that we do inside. And my second question is also, would an individual that has gone through the CTE portion of Wyndham School District, would you also consider them for your apprenticeship? Yes, yes and yes. Okay. Uh, working with uh, Desi, she's got phenomenal innovative ideas on how to work with various populations. Inherently, we have a lot of flexibility in our programs to earn credit for prior learning into the apprenticeship. Right. As long as we meet the same standards that our gentlemen from the Department of Labor uh, require, we're all for the flexibility and giving credit for prior learning, <coughs> yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's time. And Desi, again, I appreciate your time. Let me just close real quick, because I know um, uh, Norma mentioned something. Yeah, well, you have a question. Can I keep it? I'll keep it at 30 seconds, I promise, because I know Desi will kick me out if I don't. Oh, yeah. um, just to expound on a couple of people. So my name is Carlos Peluto with uh, Gulf Coast Solu um, Workforce Solutions of the Gulf Coast. There's a couple things. First, to the gentleman um, about the solar program. Although there's not specifically a solar apprenticeship program, there are components that are already in existence. For example, energy utilities installers, photovoltaics, um, electricians. So the components that go into building a solar field are available. I know that you have programs registered already that would possibly feed into that. So there are programs available that feed into the solar program. And then to the lady that spoke earlier about funding, you know, Desi mentioned yesterday that she has $3.6 million in funding available for apprenticeship expansions. Um, that is the funding that when employers are, or, or the schools are working with Workforce Solutions, 
work with your boards, work with them because we're going to be asking Desi for some of that money as well so that we can expand the programs in, in the Gulf Coast area. Um, that is a great way to get some funding. Obviously, the employers have to have some skin in the game as well. As an employer, I know we have to be willing to train our staff, um, but there are some, some financial risk mitigation factors that are available, and TWC has funding for it. Your workforce boards have funding for it. There's formula funding to assist in paying for the education part of it. Um, it's really a collaboration of everybody. So I think Carlos has done amazing with the collaboration he has up there, um, and it needs to be repeated throughout all industries and throughout our great state. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And in closing, again, we may not be perfect, but we're doing it the way we do it. It's working. But again, the key is employers. The key is having good staff like Leo. So Desi, before you shoot me, it's up back to you. <laughs> <laughs>